and I'm your MC for tonight. You are here uh, tonight. Part of a, the program is part of a monthly series of events called Astro Tours. Astro Tours is run completely by graduate student volunteers in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. We do this because we love astronomy and the universe and we want to bring it to as many people as we can. Um, some of you may have heard of the University of Toronto CA strike, QP strike. Collectively, all the graduate students at our university as well as in our department strongly support this strike. Um, so if you want more information about that, I know a lot of you have asked us about that. Um, please go on to QP3902.org. Um, and now I will introduce our lovely bow-tied speaker. <laughs> His name? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this is Ari Silbert, and he is a graduate student at the Astronomy and, and Astrophysics Department. He did his undergraduate studies at Mount Allison University. He loves planets, and he wants to know if there are aliens. Uh, but today, today, <laughs> he's here to talk to you about the science behind Interstellar. As a side note, he likes rabbits and his grandmother very much. So, you know, <laughs> we're going to show a at some point too. Um, <laughs> so, now we're going to switch over. <laughs> I'm going to leave you guys with Ari. And he's going to teach us a lot tonight. Okay. Okay. So, can you guys hear me or, or should I talk through this? Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll talk through this. Okay, I guess I'll have to duck a little bit. Okay. Okay, here, maybe I'll just quickly jack up the volume a little bit. Okay. So, let's get into the science. So, Interstellar currently ranks 21st on the IMDb Top 250 Movie Ranking List. And so, this is a list that ranks the popularity of movies. It is ranked by the public. And so, it may be a matter of debate whether or not Interstellar actually belongs with movies like The Godfather or Schindler's List or Goodfellas or, or classics like that. But one cannot deny that Interstellar has certainly had an impact on the culture today. I mean, just to see all you guys here today, we haven't had a turnout in a while, and you guys have no idea who I am, so it's got to be the movie. <laughs> so, so we can all agree at least on that. So when we look at this year's Oscars though, who, you know, the movies that were nominated for Best Picture, we can see that Interstellar does not even rank on this list. And so, <laughs> and when we compare these movies that were nominated for Best Picture to the corresponding IMDb rankings, we see that these don't even come close to Interstellar as far as popularity goes. So why is this the case? Why do the critics think that the, the, that these movies are the best, while the, pop, you know, the, the, the people think differently. My guess, my theory, is that humans are inherently interested in astronomy. They want to know what's possible, what's, you know, what, where could we go in the future, could we ever reach the stars? And together with that, we also want you know, a story that is plausible. You know, I think the stories that sit best with us are ones that are scientific, but also inspirational. And I think that Interstellar fits both of those categories. And so as far as the science is concerned, how did, it, you know, how did it rank on that scale? Well, they had a fantastic scientist on board to accomplish that task. So Kip Thorne, shown here, he was uh, the chief scientific consultant for this movie. And just a little bit about Kip Thorne, he's currently a professor at Caltech, and he studies uh, black holes, gra uh, gravitational waves, general relativity, you know, if the richest 1% rule the world, he is the equivalent of the 1% but for physics. You know, whatever people say, he listens to. And you can see here that he's sitting not in a classroom but at his home with Stephen Hawking and John Preskill. So, you know, they're, they're buddies. And so, basically, he can certainly get the job done as far as the science goes. And so, concurrently with the release of the movie, he also released a book, The Science of Interstellar. And this is a book which I will be routinely borrowing images from and quotes. So, on to the, the ranking, on to the science. So, how are we going to deal with this? So, I have a ranking scheme that I've come up with, the rocket ship metric. 
And so one rocket ship out of three means the concept is astrophysically possible and highly, but highly unlikely to occur in the universe. Two means that it is astrophysically possible and reasonably likely. And three rocket ships means astrophysically possible and very likely. And so, as you guys may have also seen in my bio, I'm actually a huge fan of Jeff Goldblum, and especially of his infamous laugh in Jurassic Park. <laughs> so, if we encounter any scientific concept that has little to no scientific merit, we're going to give it the Jeff Goldblum laugh of ridicule. <laughs> The uh, volume's a little bit low, but uh, we'll have to work with this. Sorry, the, yeah, the volume's low. All right, let's get into the science. So, the wormhole. Is interstellar travel via the wormhole actually possible? So just a quick recap to everyone, in case there are some who are a little bit confused as to maybe what a wormhole is. It is essentially a shortcut through space. So if here's Earth and here's a distant star, Vega, then essentially if we were going to travel to that star, we'd have to travel along this dotted line to get there. And that's 25 light years away, which might take hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of years to get there if we were going to physically travel there. But if we took a shortcut, a wormhole, it would take just a couple of hours maybe, maybe even minutes. It would take a much shorter amount of time. So, how does a wormhole form? It turns out that it starts with two singularities point, uh, piercing through hyperspace, which is essentially the, the space between space or the backdrop of the universe. And so these singularities pinch off, they form, and it grows to, to form a wormhole. But very quickly, this wormhole quickly disintegrates. It turns out that you, it disintegrates so fast you couldn't even send a beam of light through the wormhole before it would break apart. And so there's many things, many mathematical equations you could point to to explain why this is the case, but a more qualitative, more basic understanding is the following. Everything that contains matter contains an attractive force. So the reason why the moon orbits around the earth or the earth around the sun is because they are composed of matter and matter exerts attraction. And so it turns out that a wormhole is no different. Now it's not actually composed of matter per se, it's composed of energy. But if you use Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, which says that energy and matter are equivalent to each other, if we know that you need energy to create a wormhole, and energy is kind of the same as matter, and mass, matter exerts an attractive force, then the wormhole essentially exerts an attractive force on itself, and as a result, since there's nothing to kind of negate that attractive force, it quickly collapses in on itself. And so, what, do, what would we need in order to keep this wormhole open? It turns out we need something called negative energy or exotic matter, which essentially it's kind of a non-intuitive thing to think about, but it's essentially a repulsive force. If I had a ball of exotic matter, matter or negative energy, it would fly apart from my hands instantaneously instead of matter, which would collect together and get more and more compact. So is negative energy or exotic matter a real thing? Does it actually exist? It turns out the answer is yes. So we have experiments that actually prove the existence of negative energy and exotic matter, but this isn't the whole story. So for instance, these two effects, the Casimir effect and Hawking radiation, they do produce negative energy, but the negative energy is confined to the space with which the experiment is, is ongoing. So in the case of the Casimir effect, negative energy is produced between these plates, but if we were to remove the plates, the negative energy would disappear. It's not something that we can grab from the experiment and take wherever we want to and just put in the black hole, or sorry, the, the wormhole. And so, and, and, and I should also mention that it's produced with incredibly small amounts. And so much smaller than the amount of negative energy or exotic matter that we need to open up and keep a wormhole open. So the verdict, is interstellar travel via a wormhole possible? I think the best way to answer this question is using Kip Thorne's own words from the science of interstellar. I doubt that the laws of physics permit traversable wormholes, but this may be pure prejudice. I could be wrong. If they can exist, I doubt very much that they can form naturally in the astrophysical universe. My only real hope for forming them is artificially in the hands of an ultra-advanced civilization. So as a result, this gets one rocket ship out of three. It is physically possible, but very, very unlikely to actually occur. All right, let's go to the next topic, time dilation. <laughs> so, for, for Miller's planet, <laughs> okay, so this, this time dilation occurs during Miller's planet where uh, Cooper, Bran, and Doyle go to Miller's planet, check it out, and Romley stays behind. And when they meet up again, then Romley has aged 23 years. 
<laughs> so in order to answer this question, we need to get a little bit into general relativity. And so that might be a, whoa, a little intimidating, but we'll, we'll go through the basics. So essentially, the essential thing you need to understand about general relativity is you have to imagine that pervading all of space is a two-dimensional sheet, a grid like this. And the presence of matter warps this sheet. So here's the Earth, and it's warping this sheet. And it turns out that when this sheet is warped, then funny things happen. And so one of these things is the passage of time. So this is called space-time. So it affects space and time. And so specifically, time gets distorted or dilated or slows down. And this effect gets more extreme depending on the mass of the object. So in the, sun, in the case of the sun, the object is moderately distorted. In the case of a neutron star, which looks smaller but it's actually heavier, then it distorts it more so. In a black hole, you can see it's, it's very, very extreme. In, that, in this case, you know, these are little squares and it doesn't even really resemble a square anymore. And so this represents very, very extreme dilation. I forgot that I'm supposed to be talking into this, but whatever. <laughs> so, uh, so in the case of Miller's planet, you can see that Miller's planet is very, very far down the throat of this, of this distorted region. So the equivalent would be Miller's planet is orbiting somewhere around here. So this is in the region where time, you know, where space-time is very distorted, and as a result, time is very distorted. For a more mathematical description, maybe, this is what's going on. A more mathy version for those... Thank you. <laughs> so, the time that Cooper experiences is equal to the time that Romley experiences times this factor here, which is one minus the, squ or the square root of one minus the radius of the black hole <laughs> divided by the distance that Cooper is away. So I've color coded these so you can get a physical picture of what these actually correspond to. So this is the radius of the black hole and this is the distance that Cooper is away from the black hole. And so, the radius of the black hole is essentially just dependent upon the mass of the object. So this, you know, g is a, is a constant, it's a gravitational constant, it never changes. c is the speed of light, also never changes. 2 doesn't change. And so, <laughs> the radius of the black hole is just dependent upon the mass. So it turns out though, in order to get the time dilation factor that we want, Cooper has to be extremely close to the black hole. Essentially the radius, or the ratio of these two values is essentially 1 plus one part, you know, with an additional one part in 10,000. Which means that Cooper is very, very close. The ratio of these arrows is essentially the same. And so when we plug in the math and we do all the calculations, we end up with a time dilation factor of 60,000, which means that for every second, minute, hour, day, whatever, whatever unit of time that Cooper experiences, Romley experiences 60,000 of those. Or to put it in more familiar terms, for every hour that Cooper experiences, Romley experiences seven years. But it turns out there's a little caveat for this calculation. This is only possible if the black hole is maximally spinning. So what does that mean? So it turns out that around every black hole is something called the innermost stable orbit, or IMSO. And essentially this is the closest that something can be to constantly orbit around for all time and not eventually spiral into the black hole. So if this is an orbit of a planet, it's happily going around because it's outside. But if it's inside, <laughs> it will eventually spiral in and fall into the black hole. <laughs> so around a black hole, around a black hole that is not spinning, not spinning at all, this ratio is three times the radius of the black hole. That is the innermost stable orbit. But as we've already just talked about, in order for Cooper to have that time dilation that he needs, he has to be this close, which is much closer than three times the radius of the black hole. So in this case, if the black hole was not spinning at all, Miller's planet would not exist. It would have spiraled in, and Cooper would have no planet to go to. So now let's talk about spinning black holes. I'm going to represent this yellow arrow to represent the amount of spin. This, this means that it's maximally spinning, and this means that it's not spinning very much. So it turns out for a maximally spinning black hole, the orbit, the innermost stable orbit is pushed up right against the radius of the black hole. It's equal to the radius of the black hole. And so in this case, Cooper is just outside of that. And so Miller's planet could exist and he, he'd be able to orbit happily and there'd be a planet for Cooper to actually go and visit. But it turns out that maximally spinning black holes are very, very rare and very, very unlikely. And this is why. 
So how do black holes actually acquire spin? How would you create a maximally spinning black hole? And I should also point out, what does maximally spinning mean? It turns out that, as hopefully some people here know, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, which means that the fastest that it can be spinning is such that the outer edge is traveling at the speed of light, or just below. So nothing, you know, that's the maximum. And so it turns out, let's say if you have a black hole that is spinning, you know, half the speed of light, and an object falls in, which is falls in, in in the same direction that the black hole is spinning. It turns out, due to this fancy law called conservation of angular momentum, then basically the black hole acquires that spin that this object has, and it spins up. It acquires spin. And opposingly, if something falls in and go in the opposite direction, then it kind of counteracts that spin and, and the black hole would slow down. But it turns out something funny happens if it's going close to the maximum. And so if it's going close to the maximum, then since it can't really get any faster, or it's really hard to make it go any faster, then something that was going to fall in actually gets slingshotted away. It actually does not fall in where it may have otherwise, and so it, it gets slingshotted away and doesn't fall in. But if something is going to fall in in the opposite direction, then it will slow down just like before. And so essentially a maximally spinning black hole, it can't stay spinning at the maximum for long because as soon as anything comes along which is going the opposite direction, it'll slow down. And if something is coming in the same direction, then it will just slingshot it away. And so just to summarize everything, because I kind of went on a little bit of a journey here, in order for Cooper to experience that time dilation, he needs to be he needs to be this close, which requires the black hole to be maximally spinning, but it doesn't really stay maximally spinning for long. So, in conclusion, is it possible for 23 years to elapse for Romley, while only a couple hours elapse for Cooper? This gets two rockets instead of three, because the physics is 100% sound. That is not a contentious issue at all. It's more the practicality of it. It's very unlikely to get a maximally spinning black hole, but you know, if maybe the time dilation was more modest, 30 days to one hour kind of thing, then, then absolutely. In fact, the same general relativity which describes this time dilation, you probably use every day, every time you use your GPS. It's the same general relativistic equations that govern that time dilation. And so that is not disputed. Okay, the gargantua black hole. The gargantua black hole clocks in at 100 million suns. So how did it get so big, and is such a thing possible? So, here's a picture of the center of our Milky Way. And so it has been observed by the Keck UCLA Galactic Center Group since 1995. And they've been observing the motions of the stars around this center. And so every point of light here that you see is a sun, or a star. And this artificial star that we've put here is just to draw your attention to that region. And so when we play the video, we see that stars are appearing to orbit around something right here. But we're not sure what it is. It appears just black. It doesn't show up as anything. But a famous scientist, Kepler, Johannes Kepler, famous scientist from the 1600, developed a couple of laws. And one in particular, Kepler's third law, essentially says that if you can track the orbit of one of these stars over time, then you're able to calculate what the mass of this object must be in order for this, this orbit to take shape. And so when you perform these calculations and you calculate what this mass must be, we get about 8 million times the mass of the sun, which is pretty huge. And that's you know, pretty direct evidence that it must be a black hole. If it was some big giant star, it would be filling up the whole screen. We would see it for sure. You know, The only thing we can think of that is 8 million times the mass of the sun is a supermassive black hole. So how can something get so big? It turns out that the simplest explanation is currently our best theory that we have. There are other, you know, better ideas, but as far as the leading theory that is really the well-accepted idea, it's the following. So here we have a black hole here. It's hard to see it, but then here we have a star coming in. And so as the star is broken apart, material falls onto the black hole. Now we can kind of see it. And so most of that material falls into the black hole and the, and, and the black hole consumes it and grows in size as a result. In addition, there's an accretion disk that is formed. It's essentially residual material that orbits around the black hole and slowly falls in, maybe over millions of years. And there's big radiation jets, very powerful radiation jets as well. So in the case of Gargantua, this means that in order to grow to its current size, it would have to, be, it would have, to have consumed over 100 million suns. 
So talk about an appetite. That's one big monster. So, is it possible for something to actually get that big, a hundred million suns? It turns out the answer is absolutely. Just last week in the news, a black hole was discovered to break all the records, the largest black hole ever discovered. And this clocks in at 12 billion times more massive than the sun, or 120 times more massive than Gargantua. So, this is pretty big. If we thought Gargantua was big, this is a real bully. So, verdict. Is the Gargantua black hole possible? Absolutely. Three rocket ships out of three. Okay. Next question. Gargantua plus Miller's planet. So is it possible for a habitable planet like Miller's planet to survive so close to a supermassive black hole like Gargantua? So just to jog your memory, it's, a, it's the water world that has tidal waves and is also the closest planet to Gargantua. And so one thing that I wanted to point out, which Interstellar kind of deceived us a little bit about, is that this is not what the true situation would look like. So it turns out that we know from the time dilation calculations that we know that you know, Miller and Cooper have to, Miller's planet and Cooper on it has to be very close to the black hole in order to get that time dilation. But in this image, it looks like Gargantua is roughly you know, the size of the moon, you know, maybe as big as your fist in the sky. You can see it, but it's not, you know, in reality, it would fill up this, you know, this whole side of the sky. There's no place you could look where Gargantua would not be there. It'd be just completely in front of your view. And so this is a little bit misconstrued because of the accretion disk. So let's watch this video again, just one more time, see when the, the material falls in. And when that accretion disk is formed, it turns out that it gets extremely, extremely hot. We're talking hundreds of millions of degrees Celsius, or at least millions of degrees Celsius, it gets really hot. These radiation jets are very, very harmful, gamma rays, x-rays, you wouldn't want to be exposed to it for even a split second. You would probably die immediately. So in classic cute fashion, let's watch this again with some smileys representing Miller's planet to see what would happen as this star falls <laughs> onto the black hole. Wouldn't be too pretty. So it would quickly, it would quickly, the oceans would quickly evaporate and you know the planet itself may even be destroyed and you know we also re recall you know how big Gargantua is and how many stars it had to consume. This process would probably happen you know a hundred million times and so you know, it's very unlikely that such a thing could happen. I just want to clarify that there's nothing wrong at all with planets themselves orbiting around the black hole. The other two planets would have no problem orbiting around. It's really just the proximity. And so instead of, so, so this is a system, this is actually a neutron star, but there's, the physics are the same. If planets can orbit around a neutron star, there's no reason why they couldn't also orbit around a black hole. So. The only kind of point of contention is instead of this nice, you know, warm ocean and blue skies and things like that, it'd be more like burnt toast. <laughs> so, so what's the plausibility of Gargantua housing habitable planets? I'm not going to lie, I was really tempted to give this the Goldblum laugh, but I decided to give it one rocket ship, and this is why. You can envision some situations where maybe it could survive, and here's maybe one scenario. Maybe Gargantua grows to its current size, consuming all that matter, and then over the course of millions of years that accretion disk slowly dissipates and falls into the black hole and it becomes very stable. Then careening out of space comes Miller's planet from deep space, it's a rogue planet, and then you know gets caught around Gargantua at just the right orbit and then maybe there's just enough of the accretion disk left that it gently warms the surface kind of thing and so you know it's very unlikely but it's technically not impossible so I'm gonna keep keep it as a one rocket ship. Okay, visualization of the black hole. Does Gargantua represent an accurate depiction of what a black hole would look like? So, we're just gonna watch this one more time. I know you're getting sick of this, but we'll watch this one more time because I just wanna point out the accretion disk is very, very flat. It's essentially like a two like a, like a, like a CD. It's very, very thin. But when we look at Gargantua, we see that it looks like the, you know, the accretion disk goes everywhere. It's completely surrounding the black hole. So why is, why is this the case? What's going on? So we need to revisit general relativity again. 
So we've already learned that general relativity, you know, the presence of matter of a dense object can warp time. It can change how time moves. It can also change how light moves. So it turns out that light follows these trajectories when it's moving through space, these lines right here. And so wherever space-time bends, the light bends along with it. And so, here's a situation that, that illustrates this concept. So here we have a star right here. And so this is just giving off light as usual. And here's a very massive object. And so it turns out that the presence of this massive object actually bends the light rays, like that bending of space-time, and it bends the, the light rays back towards here, similar to how a magnifying glass bends light towards a single point. And so this actually acts like a magnifying glass or a lens to bend the light rays back. But as humans, we only see light in straight lines. We can only see where we think the light originated from. So if we were humans looking at this scenario, we would instead see two objects above and below. We wouldn't see this source because we can only see where the we think the light came from. And we see evidence of this in the real universe. So this is called an Einstein ring. And essentially the setup is as follows. Here's that massive object analogous to, oh, no, analogous to this. And then there's a, a blue source behind that. But the blue source, the, the light rays would have gone in all directions, but instead they get bent back so that we can see them. They get focused so we can see them in a ring. And that's essentially this scenario, but just rotated around in three dimensions. So it looks like a ring. And so this is kind of first-hand evidence of how matter bends space-time and therefore bends light. And so this scenario is applied to Gargantua. Here's that two-dimensional thin disk, that accretion disk. And then, you know, part of that disk goes behind the black hole. And so those light rays end up going above and below, just like that Einstein ring. And so we end up seeing the black hole completely surrounded by an accretion disk. And so that is a function of us and a function of space-time. And so, although this is very rare that a movie could lead to science, it turns out that this is the case. Oh wait, I missed the slide, sorry. So, in some, in some cases, you know, incredible work was done to the making of the black hole. So in this case right here, you know, sometimes the, the bending of space is so severe that in orbit, if this is, this is a ray of light, it can make many orbits around the black hole before it finally reaches leaves and reaches our eye and so in this case that light ray would have come from over here and then orbited around many times and then finally come to our eyes and so incredible detail was done in the making of this black hole subtle details that the average viewer would not ever recognize but they put a lot of effort into the making of this and in some cases you know it led to some real science and so two papers were published one on the making of the black hole and one on the making of the wormhole and so if you want to see the most accurate visualization of a black hole ever conceived, you know, where Hollywood and big budget Hollywood combines with real science, then bask in its glory, because here it is. Here's the most accurate depiction of a black hole, at least that, that has been advertised to me. I can't find a, another accurate one online. So, verdict, visualization of the black hole. Three rocket ships out of three. Very accurate, very inspiring that this was done finally that we have. Okay, climax. So what actually happened during the climax? I must admit that when I was watching the movie for the first time, I was a little bit confused as to like the point by point, you know, what exactly happened. So, you know, Cooper goes into a black hole, then he somehow communicates with Murph, and then somehow he's alive again and, you know, the human race is saved. So what actually happened? I'm going to give you the version that is in Kip Thorne's book in kind of quick point-by-point point format. So initially, Cooper goes into the black hole. As a scientist himself, he would know that he would probably not survive too long, but it seems like a pervading theme throughout the movie is you only live once. So <laughs> he's going for it. He's going for it. So the first thing that would happen is he would be spaghettified, which means that he would be squeezed in one direction and stretched in another. And so we can now see again how the presence of matter warping space-time affects how things go. We already know that it affects time, it affects light, it also physically affects us. We are a function of space-time and where space-time warps, 
we warp too. And so if this is what you look like before you go into a black hole, this is what you would look like as you actually go in. <laughs> so this is why it's called spaghettification. You would be strung out like a piece of spaghetti. So as you guys can probably guess, you probably can't survive like that. So we have to invoke something to make this work out. So according to the storyboard, just as the ranger is starting to get spaghettified and splits in two, Cooper falls out and falls into a tesseract, which is a four-dimensional object created by the future human advanced civilization, or the bulk beings. So then Cooper... <laughs> So then Cooper flies across the universe, back to Earth, where he relays the quantum data of the black hole to Murph via a watch, and then so that she can solve gravity and save the human civilization from complete and total destruction. Meanwhile, Cooper then flies across the universe again, where he, f he first shakes hands with, with Brand across space-time, before then getting rescued by a spaceship after getting dropped off just minutes before he runs out of oxygen and dies. <laughs> Did I get that right? So, from a scientific perspective, what are the chances that Cooper can enter a black hole, relay the quantum data to Murph with help from the bulk beans, save humanity, and live to tell the tale? What do you guys think? <laughs> I wish the sound was louder, I'm sorry. It's the best part, the laugh is, you guys all gotta look it up, it's so good. Okay, so, uh, yes, right, so uh, I'm, just, to, just to be clear, I'm not commenting on you know, the plot of the movie. I really love the movie, that's why I'm doing this lecture. I, I love the movie. I'm just merely commenting on the scientific merit of that part of the movie, is not, the most accurate. Okay, last concept that I want to go over. So tesseract, what is a tesseract? Could it actually exist? What's it all about? So here is Cooper in the tesseract and I might admit that Interstellar did a fantastic job visualizing what a tesseract might look like to humans who are inside it. So what is a dimension? We use that word all the time, you know, we live in a three-dimensional world kind of thing. But what does that actually mean? So the definition that I'm going to use is that a dimension is a coordinate needed in order to experience an event. That sounds very cryptic, so I'm going to explain what that means. So in order for you guys to come to this lecture tonight and experience this event, you know, what information did you need in order to experience this event? You needed four numbers. You needed a longitude, a latitude, an altitude or a floor, and a time. In reality, you probably just you know, drove down St. George Street, made sure you're on time, whatever. But if you were going to use a GPS, you would need four numbers. And so these are four coordinates in order to experience this event, or four dimensions. And so I know, you know we live in a three-dimensional world, but just bear with me for a second. So you need four coordinates in order to experience this event. Let's say five minutes before the lecture started. Just you know, split second before the lecture started, I changed the location to the Royal Ontario Museum. What would you do? Could you still come to this lecture? Could you still experience this event? Yes, you know, it'd be easy. All you do is walk outside of, you know, this building, you'd go up St. George over to Bloor, and you'd go to the ROM, and hopefully you'd still be in time to get a good seat. And so, no problem. And so we have the ability to manipulate these three dimensions. We can change our longitude, latitude, altitude at will. Let's say, though, that all of a sudden, five minutes before the lecture started, I changed the time to yesterday. <laughs> you know, I know that's a little weird, but let's say I just did that. I said, oh, all of a sudden the lecture was yesterday. You know, sorry, you, you can't come now. <laughs> then what would you do? Could you still experience this event? No, you know, you can't go back in time as far as anyone can tell. And so you would have missed this event. Or in other words, we have the ability to manipulate these dimensions, these coordinates but we cannot manipulate this. We only live passively in the fourth dimension, which is why we are three-dimensional beings. We can only move about in these dimensions. You know, instead, we just live moment to moment passively in the fourth dimension. We are born, we grow, and then we eventually get old and die. And that's just the way it is. We can't kind of control that dimension. But if we lived in the fourth dimension, then our life would instead be strung out like a long undulating snake and we could just go forwards and backwards through moments in our lives as we wanted to. And so if we lived in the fourth dimension, no problem. You just go back a day and you go to the event and you could still experience the lecture, no problem. 
So, this is what is showing here. This is showing, you know, the fourth dimension kind of shown in a physical way so he can actually move. You know, it's, it's unclear what it would actually look like, but they did a good way to interpret it that you could, you know, move through these events, move through time to various points in your life and get to experience various moments. So, what is the likelihood that a tesseract might actually exist? It turns out that this gets one rocket ship, and I'll explain why. So, the laws of physics do not exclude the existence of a tesseract. In fact, many theories like string theory, you know, require higher dimensions in order for it to, to work. But as far as us experiencing that dimension, it seems very unlikely. You know, where would you start? How would you go about building a machine to make you experience, you know, the fourth dimension? Or maybe, you know, it's a little bit more philosophical. Maybe, you know, we as humans are not even programmed or wired to be able to experience such a thing. And so, as a result, although it's physically the dimension is there according to certain scientific theories, very unlikely that we could actually get there one day. So, in conclusion, what have we learned? So, I'd like to think that I at least touched on most of the, the major scientific points of the movie. And if we summarize these rocket ships, we had three concepts with one rocket ship out of three, one concept with two, and two concepts with three. Not to mention one Jeff Goldblum laugh. <laughs> so, what can we conclude from this? You know, it's at least maybe a reasonable statement to say that the movie was as much fiction as it was scientific fact. But, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean that Kip Thorne, you know, messed it up? And the answer is absolutely not. You know, like the making of any movie, compromises have to be made. You know, on the one hand, Christopher Nolan, the director, he knows how to make a good movie. You know, he's made other movies that have been very successful. And on the other hand, Kip Thorne knows how to make a very, you know, rigorous piece of scientific work. But when you try to combine those two, then sometimes you have to make compromises. And I think the best way to explain kind of how things went out during the movie is taking a direct quote from Kip Thorne's book. So when Christopher Nolan told me how much slowing of time he wanted on Miller's planet, one hour there, seven years back on Earth, I was shocked. I didn't think that was possible and I told Chris so. It's non-negotiable, Chris insisted. <laughs> so not for the first time and also not for the last, I went home, thought about it, did some calculations with Einstein's rel relativistic equations and found a way. <laughs> so it seems like, like any, you know, happily married couple or anything like that, they <laughs> compromised and came to a reasonable conclusion together and etc, etc. So, does that mean that, you know, Scientific, you know, Interstellar was, you know, a little bit misleading. You know, they advertised it as a very scientific movie, perhaps. But I don't think that they, you know, there's any kind of false advertising at all. And in fact, I think Interstellar was a very, very important movie. And the reason is this. So I'm sure that most of you guys recognize who these people are. Neil deGrasse Tyson and Michio Kaku. The reason why they're so famous today is I think because astronomy is so popular in the public today. You know, I don't, at least off the top of my head, I can't think of an equivalent for, you know, English or for uh, biology or chemistry. I'm not, you know, devaluing those subjects. I, I love those subjects. I'm saying that, you know, as far as the public interest goes, astronomy seems to be right there at the forefront. And with that increasing popularity, we need scientists like Neil deGrasse Tyson or movies like Interstellar to captivate the public and keep them interested. And so, I think that because of the movie's inaccuracies, that caused so much discussion online. You know, I've never seen so much discussion online and so many forums as a result of a single movie. And so, I can't think of anything more scientific than a group of people absorbing a piece of information, questioning whether or not it's true or false, talking to their peers or going online to find out if that is true or false, and coming to a conclusion. You know, and, and I think that this engaged, you know, the average person much more than maybe normally wouldn't partake in this kind of thing. You know, judging by the packedness of this room, you know, I can tell that maybe some of you guys aren't regular attendees of these public tours, and yet Interstellar brought you guys here. And so Interstellar was a very important movie. Because I think, you know, if we're going to one day get to the stars maybe and achieve interstellar travel and see if, you know, you know, all of our dreams that we think about when we look up at the stars as possible, you know, we're not going to get there with just a couple people. You know, we need everyone on board. It's not gonna, just going to be a few scientists. And so that means, you know, 
engaging in scientific discussion and talking to each other about science and not shying away or frightening away from it. And so I think Interstellar was really important for that because it you know, was a small step for engaging the public. Thank you. I can say that because I go to them every single month. <laughs> but I'm very lucky to, to have heard this. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions, so fire away. Do you want to go? Okay. Uh, sorry, if I you want to do it. You, it's up to you. You, you go for it. I'll, I'll, I'll choose just you this first one. I'm going to let you. Okay. <laughs> um, so in your lecture, you talked about the black holes and how it, it will consume stars and it gets larger. Is it possible for black holes to get smaller? Do they just keep getting larger? Right, right, exactly. So, uh, so on one of those slides, early, so his question, in case people didn't hear, is, is can black holes ever get smaller? So the answer is yes, but very, very slowly. So it turns out there's a constant process that's always going on. It's called Hawking radiation. It was developed by Stephen Hawking. And essentially, Hawking radiation slowly, they slowly, uh, so essentially what happens is in deep, in deep space, negative energy and positive energy can momentarily spawn into existence and then they, they form again. But sometimes when they form, then that negative energy falls into the black hole. And so when a black hole absorbs negative energy or negative matter, then it actually gets smaller in size. And so, you know, once something enters a black hole, it can never leave. But this is kind of like a little bit of a technicality where if negative energy goes in, it's not like anything's leaving, but if negative energy goes in, then the black hole will get smaller. And so black holes are slowly evaporating, but over many, many billions of years, maybe even trillions of years. So, you know, I don't think we'll see a black hole, you know, evaporating anytime soon kind of thing. But technically, yes, they do get smaller over time. Uh, yeah. Okay. And I've used that to go places. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So it's a common, common I, I had no idea. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, yeah. So, in the movie, uh, essentially at the end, Murph manages to solve the equation of quantum gravity and right. the human race. Yes. So, my question is could you, um, could you help clarify what might this? quantum gravity is, what did she exactly did she solve? Right, exactly, yes. So I had a big question mark, solve gravity, you know. It's, so it's a little bit, uh, so essentially what they were claiming was going on is that, you know, they were detecting these gravitational anomalies, you know, where uh, in Murph's room, for instance, there were those lines where the dust was coagulating there more so than any other place. And so in the movie, they had this proposition that gravity was, could be manipulated. These ultra-advanced civilization, the, you know, these ultra-advanced beings had a way to control the strength of gravity. And so if you could find out the equation that could manipulate gravity, then you could simply, you know, create a bubble around the spaceship maybe and, you know, turn gravity very low so that something very heavy could just, you know, float off into space like a hot air balloon or something like that. So it was essentially solving gravity. It was essentially to find a way to, you know, manipulate gravity as, as we want to. Uh, there's no evidence that that can really happen, but that was what they were supposing could be done. Jeff Goldblum laugh? Yeah, yeah. The whole, the whole thing is a, is a Jeff Goldblum laugh, in, in my opinion. Anyways, uh, yeah. If you said um, that a wormhole forms so fast and disappears so fast that you cannot send a beam of light through it, is it because it's moving faster than the speed of light? Because as far as my understanding is we haven't found anything that moves faster than the speed of light yet. Yes, so you are, you are absolutely uh, right in that nothing can travel faster than light. And so the reason why the wormhole is so special is because it's a little bit of a, of a, of a cheat without cheating. Nothing is traveling faster than light. You're essentially uh, bending space-time and so that you know they have that classic thing in uh, I wish I had a sheet of paper that the classic thing in the movie where they say that you know if you can find a way to bend space-time then instead of going all the way across the piece of paper you can just go along the very end yeah so you know instead of traveling all the way here you can just bend it and then you can just go you know from here to here just in a second but nothing is traveling faster than light although it would appear that you know you could go it would appear from maybe an external observer that you were going faster than light, but in reality, it's all legit. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, when Cooper entered the Tesseract, he wasn't able to physically jump into the three dimension, like back in time to the message, but instead used gravity to transfer the message for the How is gravity the only force that can be transferred across dimensions that have been? Right. It was essentially like solving gravity. It was essentially a rule that was invoked. In, in the Science of Interstellar, Kip Thorne's book, he says that, you know, he has a chapter about it that says, you know, Christopher Nolan made this, uh, you know, argument that gravity was the only force that could pervade across space and time. And if you, I think if I remember correctly in the movie, on Miller's planet, right after they just hit that first tidal wave and Brand and Cooper are arguing, she talks about that. She says, oh, you know, gravity is the only thing that can go across space and time and because Cooper's trying to find a way to get that time back because they're losing all this time staying below. So again, they've kind of invoked this assumption that, oh, gravity is the only thing that can go across space and time kind of thing. But it, there's no real scientific basis for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What are some of the causes? Yeah. So, as far as natural causes, there are some theories that uh, in the quantum foam, which is essentially at the smallest scales of reality where, you know, things can magically pop in and out of existence kind of thing, that very, very microscopic wormholes can be temporarily created kind of thing. So, you know, Kip Thorne in his book has a chapter where he talks about maybe if we could grab one of these things and find a way to enlarge it to large scales and then try and keep it open, then that could be a way that we could actually uh, have them exist. Um, you can also try and form them by essentially severely warping space-time, which essentially takes a lot of energy. So, you know, as I said before, matter bends space-time and energy can do that too. And so if you get such a large amount of energy concentrated in one spot, you can essentially produce a little pinch or a singularity. And then if you have one on the other side, then they can meet and grow kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, so Matter doesn't never stop to exist, right? And you said that when it goes into a wormhole, it gets spaghettified. Uh, yep. So then what happens to that matter? So the matter does not disappear. It just gets broken down to its basic constituents. So me as my body, I'm composed of many different atoms and, and molecules and things like that. And so I would be broken apart into all of those atoms into a very, very thin line kind of thing like that. But the same amount of matter is still there as it would be before. And then eventually, as it passes the event horizon and becomes part of the black hole, then that black hole increases in size, you know, and the radius would increase as a result. And so the matter is never disappearing. It's always going somewhere, but it's just the spaghettification is the act of us getting slowly ripped apart. <coughs> yeah. Uh, maybe someone in the back. Yeah, way back there. So, uh, concerning also getting spaghettified, um, <laughs> when, if you, as a person, got spaghettified like Cooper was, uh, would you be able to see that happening, or would it still be like you seeing yourself like usual? Because that's a that's actually a really good question i i will give you my best guess at it but i will admit that i'm not like the relativistic genius so my take on that is that in any reference frame regardless if you're let's say if you're traveling exponentially close to the speed of light but not at the speed of light and you turn on your flashlight Special relativity says that that beam of light will shoot off at the speed of light. It won't be just barely slogging ahead of you. And so if there was light in the black hole, if you, had, if you brought a flashlight with you and you turned it on, then you would see, you'd be able to see yourself, I think, slowly get spaghettified because different parts of you would slowly go into different, f different frames of reference, different parts of the space-time, which would get proportionally stretched differently. Um, but you'd certainly feel it too, that's for, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, so there's that. Uh, yeah. Uh, this isn't really astrophysics related, but do you know anything about the science behind uh, the blight? The, the thing that, that, like, this thing that comes, you know, comes to the planet or is produced by the planet that basically kills off all the plants and makes it in Oh, I see. You know, the, yeah. Um, they, he talks about that a little bit in uh, The Science of Interstellar, Kip Thorne. Um, I don't have a great answer for you as to, you know, they, basically he, he talks about a number of factors which could lead to that, but it's ne even in his book it's not explicitly said this is exactly the sequence of events that lead to the destruction of, of Earth and require all this, you know, this whole sequence of events. But 
it's, he essentially gives a number of possibilities to say, oh, this is plausible that sometime in the future, Earth would need to, to go somewhere else kind of thing, but there's no specific plot that, that I could tell. Yeah. Okay, last question. Uh, is there any way to produce uh, negative energy or any alternatives? Right, so um, through different experiments, you can <laughs> produce negative energy. So there's that Casimir effect, and, and for instance, Hawking radiation is also a form of negative energy, which is how the black holes evaporate. <laughs> But it, the, the negative energy is kind of confined to those processes. It's hard to be able to make ne negative energy, take it with you, you know, put it in a container, and then just do what you want with it later. It's kind of very confined to that process and is also made in very, very small amounts. So the amount required to keep a black hole, or sorry, a wormhole open is very unlikely. Uh, thank you for, I have a few announcements. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, uh, we have this monthly astro tour. However, next month's astro tour, April, is cancelled because uh, we are having a special event for Earth Hour on the 28th of March. Uh, it will be a longer event. There will be chances for you to speak to as current astronomers in our department and ask a lot more questions uh, if you like. Um, there will also be a talk by the new director at the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics. And he will be talking about all the different ways uh, that space can hurt the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's part of the theme of uh, coming, come, coming to explore our precious space <coughs> in the universe. Um, uh, to, to go in line with the theme of Earth Hour. So no April tour, come for our Earth Hour event instead. Thanks. Um, following now we have telescope <laughs> observations and planetarium shows. Planetarium shows are only if you have signed up online. Uh, the meeting spot for the planetarium shows, go there five minutes before your show to the place in front of the elevators. I will take you to the show. If you want to go check out our telescopes, get to that same place, take the elevators up to the 14th floor, and follow the signs up even more. Um, before, before you go, if you have... It's not done yet. Thank you. Um, a lot of you will have feedback forms. If you don't, there is some... Oh no, there's no more at the front. Um, please bring your feedback forms and put it at the front so we can get your feedback. There are cookies here to entice you. It may look like there's not a lot, but Kieran has three more boxes, so come on down. <laughs> Thank you.